So from a tax planning point of view, I'm not here to show you how you should pay no taxes if you're a high net worth individual. Of course, you have to pay taxes. Okay, so what are the areas that you can, that you can in, actu in actual fact, uh, plan? We have a progressive tax system in South Africa. The higher the income, the higher the rate of tax. So the first 70,000 rand of income, you pay no tax for the year. Thereafter, from 70 to 150, uh, I think the rate's 18, and it climbs all the way through to about 675,000 in the 2015 tax year, where you will pay 40 cents in the rand. And because of the progressive tax system that we have in South Africa, the higher your income, the higher the rate of tax. So what do you have to do? It means all the income that's bunched in the name of one person will get hit at a higher rate. So if they are family members or however you want to uh, treat that, if they are family members, for example, the husband and the wife are involved in the business, but conveniently the wife helps, but she doesn't do everything, put her on the payroll and give her a salary as long as it's commensurate to the services that she's rendering to the business. But it is possible to split the income. And if you split that income, it's amazing if you work it out the actual lower tax that you pay. If your children are at university, I'm sure that they help you over weekends with the computer stuff and so on. Put them on the payroll. Give them the first 70,000 rand. Pay the university fees out of the income that is accruing to them. Now, those are things and techniques. You can't, I can't generalize and say, yes, we can do it. We need to see it on a case-to-case -case basis and then give advice accordingly. But clearly, you're allowed to do that. On the trust, I'm going to talk about splitting of income. And you know, that's the... That's a sore point now where SARS is now chasing trusts and so on. But I'm going to give you my views about, uh, about that aspect as well. But even in trusts, as you know, you can split a lot of income. So we're going to talk about that when we get there. Invest in assets that give you passive income. Remember that income is in two forms. It's either active. If it's active, then it's in the form of a salary, and therefore you pay income tax. If it's passive, then it's in the form of capital gains generally. And, and then there's what we call a tax arbitrage. The tax arbitrage is the difference between your maximum income tax rate and your maximum capital gains tax rate. And you'll see that the income tax rate is 40%. The capital gains tax rate is 13%. So there's a difference of 27%. That is what we call a tax arbitrage. And the idea is that if you're a high net worth person, you should be taking a lower salary and perhaps getting your money out of capital gains so that in that way you, you would be benefiting. So clearly, if you're investing in things like a property, shares, and unit trust, provided you're not a dealer in these things. If you're a dealer, if you're buying and selling property, then you are a speculator, and you'll pay tax on your profits on the sale of the property. But they, again, you can be both dealer and investor, and we're going to have a look at that aspect as well. So clearly, you, it is possible for you to take advantage of capital gains rather than pay income tax, gain, uh, income tax on your salary and then pay a higher rate of tax. Use corporate entities. Yes, corporate entities pay tax at the rate of 28%. You as an individual pay tax at the rate of 40%. So again, there's a tax arbitrage there as well. Shift income and expenses. It is possible, this I'm talking legitimately, for example, when you have certain expenses, which you know your tax year ends at the end of February, you know that this is a fairly high expense that you have to incur. Now you ponder whether you should incur it in the month of February or January, or should you postpone it to March. Clearly, you must incur it before the end of February. So you claim it for tax purposes in the earlier tax year, and it helps you from a cash flow point of view because you reduce your profits, and by reducing your profits, what you in actual fact do is pay less tax. You postpone the tax liability to the following year. The same would apply to income. If income was accruing to you from an avoidance point of view, you know that if, you, if it comes in in February, you'll have to pay the tax on that income. If you postpone it to March, you postpone it for the whole year. So those are things that you have to do. Again, you've got to do it on an individual basis. I think investing in a retirement fund is the only tax grace that you get these days from SARS. So if anything else is not really given to you, and we'll talk about that when you look at individuals. But you know, from 2015, they've raised that, that rate to 27.5% of your income. Now certainly, uh, that is a benefit. You know, for the, the whole financial services industry has dramatically changed. Uh, things are becoming a lot more transparent now. It's unlike before, where you never knew what were the costs. The costs were hidden, and so on. And I'm saying to you that South African fund managers are excellent. They produce decent returns for you. You can't plan very late for retirement in your life. You need to plan from a very young age. If you do that, you can punt for a return of 20% a year in South Africa. You can do that. We all talk about single-digit returns. But you have, if you do have time on your side and you, can, uh, you have an appetite for risk, 
will certainly be able to produce those kind of returns over 15 or 20 years. In South Africa, it is possible. In many parts of the world, it is not possible. So clearly, we have good fund managers. As long as everything is transparent, you can shift move, and move funds around. You need to do that. We'll talk about that later. Pay your home down bond and create an access facility. What that really means is that often people have, uh, have a bond on their house, and what they have is an access facility. And what you can do, in actual fact, is very quickly settle your home bond and then draw out of your home bond and use it in the business. The interest that you're going to pay on your home bond becomes tax deductible because you're using the money in the business effectively to earn income. So certainly those are, again, a technique whereby you could plan and then make sure that your interest is tax deductible. Pay your taxes timelessly. I went through that aspect, lifestyle reconciliation, the use of trust to split income, certainly huge opportunities there. And the idea is to plan your last will to save taxes. Did you know that from a tax point of view, estate duty is probably is the lowest, the revenue collected on estate duty is the lowest of, the, of, of all the taxes. In fact, of the one billion that they plan to collect, you'll probably find that 0.8% of the revenue has been allocated to estate duty. Now, you, sh you, should ask, you can ask yourself, why does that happen? Because there are many wealthy people that die in this country. One clearly gets the impression that the state duty is a voluntary tax. It's got the least sort of anti-avoidance provisions against it. You can plan your affairs in a way that you don't have to pay the state duty. Yet I've come across people whose estates are two, three hundred million. They end up paying very little estate duty. You get somebody who has an estate of 30 million, pays a lot of estate duty. So clearly, in the one case, planning was done upfront. In the other case, very little planning was done. So certainly, your will, which is for the ultimate benefit of your family, uh, needs to be designed properly, uh, and proper tax of uh, estate duty needs to be put into place, planning mechanisms to ensure that you pay the least amount of taxes when you die. Because remember, you not only pay estate duty, you pay capital gains tax as well when you die. Okay, so doing business in South Africa, what is the best fit? If one looks at all the tax rates, mm, what time is 10.30, did they say? 10.30, okay, thanks. Uh, doing business in South Africa, what is the best fit tax rates? Uh, company, we're looking at a company, a trust, not a special trust, a sole proprietor. If we go down the <coughs> column of the company, the normal tax is 28%. If you then declare a dividend to the shareholder, you'll pay 10.8%, but I rounded it off to 11%. That gives you a total tax you'll pay of 39%. You further, if you sell a capital asset in a company, which is the capital asset of the company, you'll pay capital gains of 66 and two-thirds of 28%, which gives you 19%. So you'll pay capital gains tax of 19%. So that's the tax rate in a company. If you look at a trust, you'll pay tax at the rate of 40% in a trust. There's no dividend tax in a trust. And you'll pay capital gains tax of 66 and two-thirds of 40% would give you 27%. So your tax in the case of a trust is 40% and 27%. And I just want to make a comment just now on trust. And then if you look at a sole proprietor, your, mar your marginal tax rate, which is not, shouldn't be zero, it should be 18, 18 to 40%, that's your marginal tax rate uh, that you pay in the case of a sole proprietor as an individual. You don't pay any dividend tax in the case of a uh, sole proprietor. And uh, you'd find that in the case of capital gains tax, you will have take the exclusion of 30,000 Rand, and you will pay a tax between 0% and 13%. So that's, again, the rate that you pay for CGT. But now, clearly, you would find here that for the first 70,000 Rand of income as an individual, you pay no tax. You'll find that uh, the, uh, the marginal rate then starts from 70,000 Rand, and it goes all the way to 675,000 Rand it gets taxed at the layered rates. So there are different bands there. And once when you hit 675,000 Rand of income, you will pay 40% tax. So any income in excess of that is six, uh, of excess of 675,000, it's a flat rate of 40%. Every Rand you earn, SARS, your partner, takes almost half, which is 40%, and you can have 60%. If you want to know exactly, people form companies and they want to know, I'm paying 28% tax, what is the cutoff point where I should rather take up to the 28% in my personal name and then thereafter leave the rest rather than paying at 30, uh, rather than paying at 40%, rather leave the rest of the profit in the company? 
So that amount, is, which is the average tax rate, is at, six, at, is at 725,000. You can see it there. It's the figure that you see there. That figure there. So that's the average rate of tax. You take 725,000 in the form of salary, leave the rest of the profits in the company, and let it be taxed at 28%. So that you would be indifferent at that point in time. I just want to, before I talk about, uh, about other considerations, okay, the other considerations would be things like limited liability, which you enjoy in a company, which you may not enjoy as an individual. Remember, if you get sued in your, uh, as a sole proprietor, you, all your personal assets are attached. In other words, your house, your car, your other interests, your investments, and so on. Whereas in a company, you get protection. Uh, certainly from a liability point of view, you just collapse the company, and that's the end of it. All your personal assets belong to you. Uh, you certainly get perpetual succession. By that, we mean that if it's in a company, your business can continue forever. You're only a shareholder of that company. Whereas if you do it as a sole proprietor, and if you die, then the, then the business ceases to exist. I think that what is important to note is that you should never leave profits in a trust. Because if you leave profits in a trust, you will pay tax at the rate of 40%. And who wants to pay tax at the rate of 40%? A trust is a pipe through which income flows. It's what they call a conduit pipe. That's, that's been used in case law. And what that actually means is that when income arrives at the, in a trust, it arrives in the nature that it came in as. If it, if it is rental, it will come in, it comes in as rental and it gets distributed as rental. If it comes in as dividends, it will come, it will be distributed as dividends. If it comes in as profit in, in the form of business, it will be, get distributed as, as such. And the idea is, once when it arrives there, after taking out all the expenses of the trust, you then open the tap and let it flow to the beneficiaries of the trust. And when you open that tap, it will then be taxed in the hands of the beneficiaries in their individual capacities, as like in the sole proprietor. And if you do that, then effectively the tax rate reduces substantially. And that is what Gordon spoke about in his last budget speech. He says he doesn't want that anymore. He wants that tax to be closed in the trust, and the trust must pay 40% tax. Now I'm going to come back to that because uh, it was, uh, you know, Treasury punted it last year. Uh, okay, let's talk about it now. I'd rather just dispense that with it. Treasury uh, looked at it carefully. Uh, representations were made by the uh, financial services sector and the fiduciary services sector. And what really happened was, which is very true, people don't form trust to, uh, to avoid tax. They form trust for other good reasons. People throughout the world form trust. The other good reasons are to protect their assets for their children, their succession planning, all of those. So the last thing that you should do when you walk out of my session here is say, I want to form a trust to save taxes. Because certainly you're dead if you actually do that. That's not the purpose to form a trust. That may be by the way that you're actually using that as a reason. So based on that, there was a strong argument that was put forward, and that argument, in actual fact, they've put trust back on the back burner. They say they will reconsider the whole thing before they do anything about it. Now let me just tell you that you have a new Minister of Finance. Praveen Gordon was really after trust. He's been at it for a number of years to say trust needed to be legislated against. If you know that the Katz Commission as well, they wanted to, in, the, in, the, in 1988, he was appointed by the then Nationals government. In 1993, he, he actually commented, uh, he completed his report, and he indicated that trusts were, in actual fact, needed to be legislated against. In fact, he recommended that trusts were making wealthy people wealthier. And on that basis, he recommended to the Nationals government at the time that what they should be doing is have a capital transfer tax. Every 26 years, perhaps one one and a half generations, you should revalue the assets of the trust and pay a capital transfer tax. But in came the ANC, and they did nothing about it. I'm not going to tell you why, but nevertheless, they did nothing about it. So we have a new Minister of Finance. Whether he's going to be chasing trusts or not, I can't really tell you that. But I can tell you clearly that those who are, who are in trust and those who plan to form trust, if you have good reasons to form the trust, you must go ahead and form the trust. If you save tax, good luck to you. Okay, if you look at uh, this whole argument about capital versus revenue from a tax point of view, when you sell a property or you sell shares on the JSE, what are the tax implications? It's quite important to also understand whether you are a property investor 
whether you're a property dealer. Because these are two opposite sides of the coin. Really, if you're an investor in property, in other words, you buy property to get rental income, you ultimately sell it for reasons that are beyond your control or whatever it is, you regard it as an investor in the property. And if you're an investor in the property, and if you're a high net worth person, you're probably paying 13% capital gains tax on the profit, the difference between what you paid for the property and what you received for the property. You could have made improvements to the property, you're allowed to claim that as part of your costs, and that difference then is taxed at a capital gains tax rate of 13%. On the other hand, on the other extreme, if you are a dealer in the property, then in other words, you buy and you sell property as to make a gain out of it. In other words, it's your business to buy and sell property. In that case, you would pay revenue tax, or you'll, you'll have a revenue gain, and you'll pay tax at the rate of 40%. So that's your maximum tax rate for income tax purposes. So clearly, these are two separate sides of the coin. There is no halfway house when we look at these aspects. And you could have a change of intention. We have these famous cases of Natal Estates and Buria West. Both of them are KZN cases. And uh, as you know, Natal Estates is probably the case that refers to the property north of the Durban North in, uh, in that area on La Lucia and Amshlanga and all of that going further north where, remember that Hewlett's were just cane growers. All they were doing is plowing the, the land and actually cutting the cane and then making sugar cane making sugar out of the cane. Uh, they had saw the threat from the Durban City Council of expropriating their land. And what did they do? They started to cut up the land. They got a whole team together. They got engineers, architects, uh, estate agents, land developers, all of these people together. And they started to do the business of selling land at a profit. And what then really happened was, the famous, in that famous case, they talk about crossing the Rubicon. And what it really said is that you're moving away from what we would say on the one side of the shore, the Rubicon is the river. From one side, which is the investor, you're moving across to the dealer. And the moment you get, start to do these things, you start to move along this river. And you get to about that point. There's no point of no return. You cannot go back there. You have to go forward and then you become a dealer. So typically, in the entire estate's case, when they kicked off with, if, if I take the simple example of a, you buy a block of flats, flats as an investment. You now decide after five years, you say, yeah, it's giving you a decent return. You're quite happy with a 10% return. However, somebody says to you, you can make a lot more. How do you do that? Sectionalize the property. You sectionalize the property, you're an investor, you, you made the first step. You start to do, get the interior done, you put in new built-in units. You take the second step. And then what you do is that you, you go on further and you start to do further improvements to each apartment. And slowly you're now moving in that direction towards the dealer. There will come a time when whatever you're doing, you now have crossed that point where you're now considered to be a dealer in that property. And they will tax you. And you have to pay income tax on it. And that's what the Natal Estates case was all about. One year later in an appellate division case, both of these are appellate division case, they heard the case of the Buria West. The Buria West is the area where 45th cutting, I don't know if you know where the University of KwaZulu Natal is. That is the Buria West. Sorry? Yes, correct, and further. Oh, is it? Okay, the Dew. Okay, well, well, we know in that case, what really happened was the fact that it happened just after 1975. SARS, was, uh, SARS or the receiver at the time, was convinced that they had, the Buria West was going in the direction of, of Natal Estates. And so they actually took the executors to court. And what really happened there was a similar principle. Husband and wife died, and a uh, whole lot of beneficiaries that uh, were appointed from, if I may say, from, from business people to people who were bus drivers and so on. It was a huge family. And how to split that, uh, this estate or this property among so many people. So what the executor did, he tried to follow the Natal Estates, what they had done, cut up the property, but did not as vast as what uh, Natal Estates have done, and then sold all the properties, and then gathered all the income and distributed it. And Sar said, no, that is, as far as we are concerned, you've crossed the Rubicon, and therefore you're a dealer, you must pay tax on it. But Sars lost the case. So clearly you can see that there are these extremes. 